Danny is going to be talking about her research and the title of her presentation is, or some of her research, I know Danny, Danny has a lot of very, um, very interesting research projects on the boil. But this one she's talking about today is social value and social return on investment, or what's called SROI. A case study with multilingual crisis communication and students as translators. Sounds fascinating. Danielle, and we are very excited to welcome you now to present your lightning talk. Okay, so I will share my screen and I'm just going to hopefully get the right one because I have notes on one of them. So, <laughs> Just while Danny's setting up, can I, can I just comment that I went to a lightning talk some time ago that Leone hosted mm. and um, she asked everyone to just pop in the chat some some sparked ideas that were coming to your to your into your thinking as you were listening to the talk um you know in terms of how it might connect on with your research it might be a concept that you're that that you're feeling a, a resonance with or part of a methodology so feel free to pop some comments in the chat as we go through that would be fantastic so um i assume everyone can see my screen and as Jen has noted I'll be talking about uh, an approach to research I suppose called social return on investment and I'll be using the digital badge that I recently um, had approved on multilingual crisis and disaster communication. I spoke about that last month there, there was a last minute opening for a lightning talk I'm not just someone who's trying to take over the lightning talks each month um, there was a last minute opening so if anyone wants to know what that digital badge is about and the research associated with it in more detail there is actually a recording up from last month as well but I'll use my example um, throughout this just because I attended three days worth of training in Perth for this and we were actually able to work through my example. So I got to work with one of the uh, consultants that was um, from the company that was delivering the training and was just really lucky that we had enough of them there so that we could almost do this uh, live. So um, I would also like to acknowledge the land on which I'm presenting from today. So I'm on Turrbal or Yagara land here in Mianjin and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. And also that this always was and always will be Indigenous land that continues to be unceded as well. Oh, next slide, please. OK, so what I'm going to go over today is what is <clears throat> social return on investment? Because if you're like me, I hadn't heard of it until last year. I'm also going to mention why it might be helpful for education, social science, humanities researchers, because it has really come out of business and a lot of consultants are using it. So it, it does appear in research, but predominantly I'm seeing it in industry reports that are done in collaboration with consultants. Um, but I do think there's absolutely scope for researchers to be making use of this in particular ways. Then I am going to go through in a very a brief way how you can do an SROI. That's probably helpful just so that you can get an idea of if you've got something it might work for. I'm going to be missing a lot of detail because, as I said, it was three days worth of training for me to go through and get all of the information around it. So uh, it's going to be a really, um, yeah, just a just a brief overview for that. And Jen, sorry, can I confirm how long do I have? I know I was told I could have a bit longer because we just had two, but I'll try to stick to time. <laughs> I think roughly 20 minutes okay. um, would allow us to have some conversation. We only have two presenters and, yep. and Jason's not with us just yet, I don't believe, but I'll I'll t send him a message. So okay. 20 minutes. Yep. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so throughout as well, I'll just give you some tips and cautions and I'll point you to some resources so that if you do want to try and do one of these yourself, that um, you can give that a go and you're welcome to reach out to me. So what is a social return on investment? If you've not seen it before, um, it can be presented in a number of ways. Most commonly, it gets presented as how much money would be returned for every dollar invested, but it's talking about the social return. So these are things um, that might not actually have a monetary value assigned to them. And you go through this process of uh, coming up with a way to assign financial proxies or a financial value to the social benefits from your project activity program. Um, and we've got you know, the actual definitions here. It's a framework to measure and account for the value created by a program or series of initiatives beyond its financial value, but you put a financial value on it. And I think that's really, really handy when many of us are doing projects or social related research in which 
we're still competing for grants against people who are able to put statistics or put numbers on things, and we can't always do that. So it actually gives you a way of being able to put a number on something that's quite short, snappy, digestible for funders or government when they're looking at something. So essentially, it goes through a methodology for assigning that monetary value uh, to the social benefits that are generated, and it can look like the total benefit for a participant, but most often I see it reported as the social return on investment is $5.50 per dollar invested. So it's really quite a short statement that you're able to make about something that you're doing that's kind of quite easy to understand in that you can see there's a benefit to it and anything above one. So anything above one dollar, uh, so getting back more than you put in would be considered good here, but there are not specific guidelines around, you know, what exact amount um, is, is a particular benefit there. So just a couple of other reports um, from education initiatives in case you'd like to go and see how that's been done. These are industry reports. One was with Good Start Early Learning, so they did find $5.50 versus, uh, of social and economic value generated through a range of things that they were doing. Obviously, it's an early childhood centre, so they do more than just one thing. There was also Skyline Education. Theirs came out with $12.19. Um, and you can see here in terms of the calculation, it's it looks very straightforward. It is what's the value of all the social things and the social benefits that are in the project uh, divided by the input costs. So in terms of the maths, that looks really simple, uh, but it's not that easy. So let's continue and we'll get to see a bit more about why that's the case. But before we get into that, um, again, I just wanted to point out why this might be useful. Um, I know for me, I heard about this and I thought, oh, that would be really good to be potentially putting in grants. Um, or anything that maybe I want government or policymakers to be paying attention to. Government does use this. I've seen a lot of government reports drawing on this and even developing their own guidelines. So I think it's a good way to put the value of something that you're doing that's got social benefits in monetary terms that's easy for some other people to understand. But it actually captures quite multifaceted aspects of what we're doing. So I was pleasantly surprised to see that it could do that. I do think it helps build a case, whether that's for grants, promotions, or what we are increasingly being asked to do, um, that is within our group, Griffith Experts page, adding these impact narratives. Um, you might have heard some talk about that, but I'm on the university research committee and we just had someone come and talk to us about the fact they're really going to be pushing that in um, in the next little while. And I think that a, the impact narratives would be a really good place for this. There's enough word count to explain it but you don't have to go into a ton of detail. So I think that would be really good. And it also helps you plan for impact. I know we're being asked to think about that and um, that's something I kind of find a bit tricky. So this was really good in that it, I found it quite a helpful process. Even if you don't end up spinning out a number at the end, there's some steps at the beginning that are even really quite helpful for thinking about that. So, um, and as I mentioned, I'm predominantly seeing this used in industry reports or government reports, but there, there is academic literature around this. And these are a couple of examples, and I'll share the slides with you. You can click on all these links um, of where it's being used. It, it tends to work best where there's a very clear something that you could describe as an intervention. And I know not all of us would describe what we do in our research with those words. It might be an activity, it might be a new teaching approach, something like that. Uh, but you can see examples. And if you only get a chance to look at one of these, I strongly recommend this last one, the Revulo et al 2020. They actually talk about a number of programs at a number of levels of education. So I think there's something for everyone to have a look at there. But you can see that it's been used with construction training, the introduction of a library, or co-curricular programs. So so it certainly has been used. I think finding where which journals accepted and, and everything is um, a whole nother ball game, but it, it does get published as well. So can be useful. OK, so the bit we're all waiting for, how do we do an SROI? There are quite prescriptive steps for that to come up with the formula that I mentioned before. So again, it's coming up with the value of um, all of the social benefits divided by the input um, times 100% and then you get your social value and you spit out usually a number value like that. But as I mentioned, there's quite a few steps to get to being able to do that. It's not just um, that easy. This um, visual here I think is quite helpful. So there are essentially six stages. I'll pretty much go through five of them today because the reporting stage really depends on how you want to do that. And there are a number of principles underlying that. For me, a lot of those principles are basic good research principles. So I don't think any of them would surprise anyone here, but certainly for those who are not bound by institutional ethics and uh, research ethics uh, in, in industry, perhaps they, they might be something worth um, kind of focusing on a little bit more. 
Um, but we'll start with having a look at the example today. So there is a template that helps you go through all of that and it will do the calculations. It's got it all built in there. So the template I've put in here and there's a link. So again, I can share that with you. There's extra examples there as well using wheels to meals. I'll use my example today. This is vaguely what the um, the template looks like as well. So again, I've got a link for you there if you want to go and see it. Uh, and you may want to do that. I'm just wondering if I should put that in the chat because it can be quite small. So please let me know at any stage if things are just too hard to read. But stage one is really establishing the scope. So when I'm thinking about this and when I was in the training, it seemed really important to pick a small project or activity. Some of those other industry reports I showed you from Good Start, for example, they were looking at a number of things that that good start with doing. It will be quite complicated, I think, especially if you're trying to do this yourself to look at so many things. So the, the more narrow you can make your focus, is it a particular teaching approach? Is there a new way of teaching reading to kids in your research that you're looking at or maths? I don't know. Um, anything you can describe as some kind of intervention because you need to see change and ideally you need to be able to see the change from pre and, and post as well and be able to measure that. There is the option to do this as a forecasting approach, so predicting the um, social value. I think that would be very, very difficult. I would strongly recommend doing it as what they describe as evaluative, which is where you um, look at it after you've done it, and it's. Um, but at the same time, to plan for doing this. I wouldn't recommend that um, you're sitting here today and you think, oh, there was a great thing that I did last year. Let me now go and try and work out the social value of it. You you can do that. I think it would be very hard. It would be much better to actually think, all right, I've got one coming up. Let me plan for that. And as I go through things today, you'll probably get some ideas. So for mine, I was looking at um, the activity was the translation of health materials for charitable organisations, and it was being undertaken by student volunteers supported by training and AI. Um, and the impact of that would be that it led to the efficient production of language appropriate health materials for culturally and linguistically diverse uh, communities. So the, the template has room for you to try and, and describe that and get you started. The next part that I thought was quite helpful was that you think about your stakeholders. I know we may not all use that term. Um, people you're working with, the people who are going to hopefully benefit from the activity that you're undertaking. So we did a whole mind mapping session on this. We spent quite some time going through it. For my project, it was going to be universities. We had two involved, the health organisations, Cal community members, as well as the university students who would be involved in it as well. And um, then we wanted to think about what outcomes for them might they get out of it. So for our university students, for instance, they would get the chance for online socialisation. We had two universities, in uh, one in Hong Kong and Australia, so they got to actually also socialise. They got training in particular language approaches for translation. They got to be involved in international collaborations. For our NGOs, obviously, they got more um, documents, so that was really great for them. And for our CAL communities, um, Again, they got materials that were culturally sensitive and accurate um, and access to that. And for the university, we thought about things like internationalization, um, enhancing our international partnerships uh, and, and other things. Those were our original ideas. Um, it is recommended that when you think about what those outcomes are, that you actually ask the different stakeholders to give you that information. So they're quite open within an SR SROI approach to using focus groups or surveys. If you didn't have access to that, they also talk about using other existing research or publicly available data. I think it would be ideal if you're going to be publishing in a journal or something like that, or just good practice anyway, is to have both. We were really lucky in this project that I did in that we were able to actually um, have interviews and focus groups with the different stakeholders and we were able to get information from them about what it is they wanted to get as the outcome from this project. We also were able to find other research and the majority of the other research that I've got to sort of confirm that is Australian based. So you can see this wasn't something that we did in the training and I'm not sure it's something consultants would be doing but I think as academics this extra step is something we're very well placed to do. Um, and for many of us this could be applied on something that is part of our research um, plan. So we've done other research related to this. I was very fortunate that we also had a paper, me and my other collaborator for this, uh, talking about some of these elements. So we had our own work that we could rely on from other published data as well. So I think that part would be really important for adding just to um, 
make sure there's some rigor to, to what's going on here. The next part of this stage two is mapping the theory of change. So it's actually about thinking in, uh, around those outcomes. Um, and this part was quite detailed, so I just can, cannot cover it all. But you might want to think about are there short term or long term outcomes. Some of the really important things that you do need to consider are would this change have happened anyway, whether or not you did your activity? If that's the case, it's probably not something to include in your spreadsheet or in your social return on investment. The other thing I would bear in mind is, is there any feasible practical way you're going to be able to measure this. So that's another reason why I think it's quite important to think about this before you go and do an SROI, because it's quite easy for us to build in reflections or initial surveys for people doing our projects so that we have something to compare to at the end and we can repeat that. Um, we were able to do that in the project that I had. We had the students completing reflections throughout. Um, but it's just about thinking of, of, you know, is there going to be a way to do it? You don't necessarily have to have the answer at this stage as to how. The other thing I just bear in mind, um, and once you work out what financial proxies are, you can kind of start getting an idea of whether it'll be possible. But some of the outcomes we might put in, is it going to be possible in any way, shape or form? to assign a financial proxy. Some of them are amazing, but it might just be too hard or impossible, um, or the financial proxy that you would need to assign wouldn't be accepted by whoever you're going to be sharing this information with. So if you're going for a journal article, they're going to have pretty high expectations. If you're working with an industry partner, they might be okay with something else. The other big sort of principle with the SROI is does this matter to the people involved? So just maybe checking in and ensuring that if you're updating the outcomes, um, yeah, will they still be important to your stakeholders? Um, how long does it does it last? Yeah, th those sort of things there. So it's really about um, engaging with that theory of change for the second stage. So for ours, what we were able to do, we sort of um, updated the outcomes there and improved employability, increased intercultural communication skills, expanded service reach, reduced anxiety. There were lots of different things that we were able to include there. Um, at this stage, I think in the training, we did do this at this stage. Um, it's also a good idea to think about what the inputs are. So that's where you can actually start to think, okay, uh, for instance, we had university students, they were doing about 20 hours of work that was going towards producing these materials. And if we were to pay them, I don't know, market rate for a casual job of $30 an hour, inclusive of super and tax, um, and we had 60 of them, that would actually mean that there was about $36,000 of in-kind support going into this. So you can include in-kind inputs here. Um, and then we, you know, we included that for each of our um, stakeholders as well. So um, that is actually a really important step to do here. I I don't think that's clearly pointed out as to where you would do that in the instructions, but we did it at the start. You can obviously update that and check it at the end as well. So once you have done that bit, uh, that was just another example, but for time we'll, we'll skip that. Um, we need to start evidencing the outcomes. So this is one where I think you really need to plan ahead to think about this. So if you're thinking about, uh, you know, the students increased their intercultural communication skills. Is that that something you need to have uh, a survey at the beginning and the end or a reflection that you could collect from the students? Could you compare that to any other public data? For instance, are there, I was thinking maybe there's some um, employability surveys that we could compare with, with our project um, in the literature to look at for that. Some of the other things in this project were really simple. So, for example, expanding the service reach, um, we could look at the access reports once the translated documents were on the website. Um, improved quality and quantity of information, we can just count how many more of them there are. Something like uh, reduced anxiety about the issue, um, that one we can do interviews with as well. So the, the, this approach is quite open to a range of different approaches to try and evidence this. But I think the main thing I would advise is to, to just plan that in advance um, to check that there, there will actually be a way to do that. And if there's not, do you need to build that into your to your research and what you're doing? The next step is assigning a financial proxy. And this is the bit I think everyone got the most excited about. How do we do that? How on earth do you assign a financial proxy to something like um, expanding the service reach in which we produced more documents? So that one was actually pretty straightforward in the end, because you think about if, if your project were not to provide this, what's the other option? How else would someone be able to get um, 12 pages of information about neurofibromatosis in Indonesian? And the, the other main way to do that, if you can't 
as an organization or a consumer afford a translator is you can use the interpreter hotline. Uh, that's government run, but it actually costs $112 per hour to do that. So even conservatively estimating that for one language, that would cost um, $112 per hour, we were able to um, get, get a sort of yearly cost based on how many people might need to access that. The same thing with market translation for the documents. Um, the organisation we worked with actually had been given a quote of $20,000 per language and we worked with four languages with them. So um, that would have cost them quite a lot for the documents that they needed. Um, some of the other things I think could work really well for us being in education, if you're providing training, is there other training that it there's nothing identical to the digital badge that I did, but there's things that are similar. Uh, for instance, a, a certificate in medical translation at UNSW. That would be the only similar thing that someone could do to learn the skills that we were teaching in this digital badge. So we were able to look at what the price of that would be for eight staff, for example. So really, I, assigning the financial proxy is all about thinking, if this, were not, if this activity were not to take place to produce this outcome, how else would someone get that outcome? Um, and we can certainly, I'm more than happy to chat with people more about that as well. Um, our next step is, I put this image in because you really have to rein it in. You can see some of those numbers there were pretty big. Um, and I am not claiming that the digital badge is generating a million dollars worth of social benefit. Um, there is a, quite a, a nice process for actually acknowledging, for instance, the increased intercultural communication skills, we can look at things like dead weight. So that is about acknowledging the fact that would some of that have happened anyway and how much of that could be attributed to your project. So we thought for um, our example, probably 80%, that would have happened anyway. So maybe 20% of that could be attributed to the project. And the spreadsheet will do all this magic for you and take 20% of the monetary valuation and put it in another column. So you don't have to, to do that. Um, and it does that for, for all of those sections there for you. Um, and it's got a few other ones there. I think really the dead weight is probably the main one. And for time, I'm just going to have to gloss over those today. Um, and then you get to doing your calculations. So all of those bits take quite a bit of time. Then we uh, get to calculate it. So um, it will add up all of those um, impacts and the social, the cost associated with those different social benefits. And it will put them into the calculation. So the total value divided by the input. So for that one, um, it ended up being 357480 divided by 99960 So we got $3.57 for every dollar invested. And that was a pretty quick um, process. I didn't, you know, we did that just through the training. So there's definitely potentially more things that could have been added. Um, after that, it's really just thinking about how you might like to report that. So as I've mentioned, industry reports, there are many. If you Google in uh, SROI report, there's a lot of government and there's a lot of industry ones. Obviously, the structure is going to vary a little bit um, given the, the variety there. I did also mention that there are some publications as well. So you'll, I'll share these slides. You're most um, welcome to go and have a look at those and see how they've done it. Um, but I think the main thing is transparency is reported uh, is important here. So in including the detail on how you made decisions around all of those things is really important. The example they kept giving in the training is think of this like accounting. Accounting isn't actually always 100% correct, but they let you know how they made the decisions to come up with a, a calculation in accounting. And I guess that's something that made me feel a little bit better about using this. If you do want to learn more about this, because as I said, my overview has been very brief, um, this video looks pretty good to me. It has come from um, two people in universities and it goes for, I think, nearly two hours. So I think it would give more than enough detail if anyone wants to follow up. Two readings. Um, I really like this first one. It's Advancing the Social Return on Investment Framework. And they actually did some interviews and a scoping review of other examples of them. So there's lots of tips and tricks in there for how you could actually maximise this uh, if you want to publish it. Um, and then a slightly older one looking at whether or not academics have actually advanced this methodology. And one of their findings or one of their, their comments was that within papers where we've got a strict word limit, it can be really hard to maintain the transparency of this because you can't include explanations of why you've done and made every single decision, which is kind of at the heart of um, doing this. Um, however, if you still want to have a look at things a little bit more, there is a guide. There's a DIY guide I've linked here, as well as, again, that um, template that will do all the maths for you if you're not a uh, maths whiz like myself. 
Otherwise, I welcome any questions because I, yeah, there's so much more detail to it. I've tried my best to cover what I can and thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Wow, you do some very interesting things. <laughs> that was such an eye-opening presentation for me. Thank you. I really, really uh, was quite blown away by this as a concept even, mm. but also the, your, your your slides were beautiful. You present so, so clearly. And the example of your own research was really helpful for us to understand what this methodology really is. Mm. So thank you. Super presentation. So I'd like to throw it open to um, to comments or questions for, for Danny. There's a couple popping up in the chat, but um, now's your time to jump on in. Thank you. Oh, Stephen or who was first? Summer or Stephen? Summer? Yes, yeah. Summer. Yes. Summer. <laughs> Hi, I think Stephen's hand up hand was up first, but he's he's been kind, so I'll, I'll ask my question. That was really really interesting. Thank you, Danny, because we do we are increasingly being encouraged to report on impact, and you're giving us the um, you're showing us the method for doing that. When I worked in the EPA in government, like around the, the change of the century, there was a triple bottom line thing going on where people were doing this monetary type of translation of social environmental and, um, money so that they can compare things and at the time I remember there was a debate about how some things couldn't be translated into money so they had a three-dimensional reporting money social and environment I was just wondering if that had been integrated into this kind of way of looking at it, or if that's a separate parallel yeah, I know they didn't mention it and they're sort of common. I do remember them saying if things are hard to measure, it's not that they're impossible. It, I think it would really come down to what would be accepted. Um, mm -hmm. And the more comfortable you are with um, qualitative approaches being used, I think you can put it in. But as I mentioned, I think it would really depend what you're doing and who you're working with. Um, it was a really interesting group that were in the training because we had people, again, from government, and I remember one of them saying that he'd read this education report. What was the one that recommended that everything uses RCTs? And, um, you know, I thought, oh, that's just not possible. That <laughs> So, right. yeah, I don't know. I think maybe it would be interesting to see when people put these into a research context, are people who know research actually more okay with the qualitative stuff because we understand why it's important versus those who maybe less familiar with all of that um yeah i i i'm not sure I, my sense is this has the sroi approach has been around for a while and yeah it weirdly might be the most open to social stuff but hasn't been updated for a little while so it would be good though if if you have any information on that to maybe think about that in collaboration with this mm -hmm. yeah i'll stick it out so <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah thank you Great question, Selma. That's really nice. You made an interesting connection to your previous work, which was really good for us to hear about too. Stephen Hodge, your hand has been in the air for a while. Take it away. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, and what a great presentation, Danielle. This is uh, obviously a methodology that we would have to get our heads around. It's um, uh, it's not a very, um, it, it's not a I suppose, a traditional methodology for us. I just mm -hmm. want to know whether um, the impact um, portfolio and agenda in Griffith University is using anything like this to try to talk about impact. Ah, oh, that's a really good idea, uh, good question. Um, I think that would be something worth following up on. Um, but um, apart from going through everyone's experts pages and checking their narratives on there um i don't know off the top of my head but i think that's absolutely something we should be asking the team in charge of that yeah because there, there is a team and they've been yeah. developing their tools for quite a while but there perhaps the other uh, another uh, point um looking at um jen's comment back there yes a neoliberal idea to assign yeah. a financial proxy <laughs> to the social impact but 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 I I think it is 
um, a, a methodology like this is an attempt to talk to certain audiences. Yeah, um, I I agree. I must say, when I first went to this, I just was I had, I had to bite my tongue quite a lot during the training, Jen, um, because there's <laughs> certainly things where you go, oh, but I think it is about yeah the audience that you need to communicate this with and being able to communicate it in language they understand i know as a language person you appreciate that you've got to talk to people in in numbers they understand sometimes so i think it's one way of doing that um and i must say i was pleasantly surprised by how open the approach is to the messiness and the the slipperiness mm -hmm. and the qualitative nature of the research that we do um they were actually really yeah quite quite okay with that and they would just say just be transparent about how you've done it um which i think is really fair yeah thanks danny thanks danny yeah that it may in fact be an, an interesting exercise to try to kind of do the economics on it and fail mm. and fail to do the economics on it yeah and then, <laughs> and then go back and work out well how do we then talk about impact of social research if not in economic terms you know so yeah, yeah. and I, I would agree that it's probably not something that everyone would rush to do but um but in fact deeply consider the merits of it for your particular project at a particular yeah. time yes yeah. definitely yeah. It won't anybody work else everything. Yeah. yeah Sama has her hand in the air but is there anyone else who would also like to comment or question and if not Sama back to you <laughs> Okay, <laughs> silence is a vote then that I can talk again. <laughs> so this was actually my first thought, Danny. I was thinking, oh, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of GAR, maybe Griffith, to collaborate to create this data bank of costings of social outcomes. Because mm. if you do the costing of something, you know, and someone else has to do a similar one, they can refer to what you've done. Mm. Textualize it differently or update it or something, but I don't know how we do that. But I feel like even if we just put all the costing documents in a place and you just had a checklist of which things you've costed, we could mm. kind of search across mm. things because, yeah, that's the problem, isn't it, with all this kind of accounting is knowing what to put in there and you just need, you know, monkey see, monkey do type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I did think that it would be great to have examples of that. But, yes, yeah, certainly with the costings and, and just knowing examples of what could be done, I think, yeah, would be great. Great. Hey, thanks, everyone. Yep. Really rich discussion.